Alrighty. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Recycle Smart Investor Q&A. My name is Marty from Virtual and we're really excited to be hosting the Recycle Smart team here tonight um, to talk about their upcoming investment offer on Virtual and answer any questions that you might have. Um, as more people join, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping from my end. So like I said, this is a Q&A session. So we're here tonight to answer any questions you might have. You'll see down the bottom there is a little button for, for questions and answers. If you have a question at any time, please chuck it in there um, and we'll try and get to it as soon as possible. Um, the structure for this evening is I have a little bit of a presentation from virtual to go through for the first five minutes. Then the Recycle Smart team will go through a, a presentation deck to talk about uh, their business journey and this investment offer for about 10 or 15 minutes. Then the rest of the time we'll have saved for questions and answers. Um, the other feature of the questions um, function is that you can upvote questions if you want it answered. And that's how we're going to prioritize which questions we get to first. So you'll see a little thumbs up button next to the questions. Uh, feel free to give that a thumbs up if you want to hear it answered. Cool. What I'll do now is just pass over to the Recycle Smart team for some introductions and we'll go from there. Brilliant. George, you want to go first? Sure. Thank you. I'm George from Recycle Smart. And um, the co-founder of 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 yeah of this beautiful idea that we're going to explain you soon. Uh, hi, my name is Marco, and I'm the CTO and co-founder of Recycles. Yeah, Eugenie. all right, go first. Um, hi everyone, I'm Eugenie. I'm the chief marketing officer for Recycles, and I'm very excited to be here with you tonight. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mark uh, and one of the advisors uh, of Recycle Smart. Also very excited to be here. Great, thanks for that. And yeah, we've got a um, full team from Recycle Smart to answer questions from any angle you might have tonight. Um, so please feel free to chuck them in whenever you have them. We've got a big um, list of attendees tonight, which we're really excited to, to speak to. And thanks so much for everyone giving us some time in your evening to connect. Got an hour for this webinar. It is being recorded, so feel free to not take notes uh, if you want to. And if you have to duck off, the recording will be available within 24 hours for you. Um, now that we have a few more attendees joining, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Birchall is beaming in from the lands of the Rurundri people of the Kulin Nation. And we acknowledge them as the traditional owners of the land and pay respects to elders past and present. Um, what I'll do now is jump into a bit of a presentation from Birchall's end, because uh, we know that maybe some people haven't heard about us or equity crowdfunding. So we'll go through that for the first five minutes, and then um, we'll get to Recycle Smart after that. So I'll just share my screen. Of course, we start at the back of my slide deck. So um, yeah, like I said, just a bit of an overview from our end. What is equity crowdfunding and who are virtual? That's what I'm going to cover now. So a bit of a disclaimer to kick us off um, because this is a financial services industry that we're operating within. So Virtual is working with Recycle Smart on this upcoming crowdsource funding offer. Virtual Financial Services is the licensed intermediary for the offer. The information and discussion in this webinar is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as advice or recommendation to invest. Please do your own research. Always consider the offer document and general crowdsource funding risk warning before investing, which is available on our website. And um, you'll, you'll get some more details about what the offer document is and when that will be available later on. So crowdsource funding, you may or may not have heard of it. It's a new type of capital raising that is growing in popularity. The laws were introduced in Australia in 2018. Um, before that, the UK sort of trailblazed this industry in the early 2010s. So it's, it's re relatively new. Um, essentially, this allows companies, early stage companies, to raise capital from a community of investors. So the big difference from a legal perspective is that companies that uh, go through crowdsource funding are not um, coming under the shareholder limitations. So for a private company in Australia, you're only allowed 50 non-employee shareholders. Um, what that means for a lot of companies is they're limited to raising funds from high net worth individuals or venture capital firms. Um, but with crowdsource funding, those limitations don't apply, which opens up um, these opportunities for a large group of investors. So for companies, the win-win is not just getting uh, money, but also having an engaged group of people who wanna see their business succeed. And for the investors, for everyone on this call, the opportunity is to get in early with these trailblazing companies um, and, and back them at a stage where, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential. 
Um, this is regulated very heavily by ASIC and Birchall's role is the gatekeeper of those laws. So what we do is we make sure that all um, investment opportunities that we put live on our platform are compliant with the rules and regulations. Um, and ASIC is obviously the body that uh, governs the ASX as well. So this is a highly regulated industry and we'll get into a bit more detail about that later. Um, and one of the key features is that companies that want to raise through crowdsource funding have to use a licensed intermedi intermediary like us to do so. Virtual is the biggest uh, equity crowdfunding platform in Australia. Um, we've got more than 200,000 members and we've now done more than 200 deals. Um, so, you know, since 2018, um, we've, we've had a lot of success in this area. Um, that means we have the most experienced team. The, the platform that we use has, has seen the most activity. So uh, I guess the main thing to point out here is you're in safe hands and we've done this a fair few times before. My role is as a campaign manager. I work really closely with all the companies to put their opportunity together and get it out to market. So we've been working with Recycle Smart for, for almost a couple of months now to get this opportunity live and really keen to see it uh, go live on the platform very soon. And just finally, a few frequently asked questions from our end, hopefully to head off any um, confusion you might have about what virtual does and how the platform works. So you'll hear um, us talking about two different stages of the campaign. There's what we call the expression of interest, which is where we're at the moment for Recycle Smart. So this is where we're just asking investors or potential investors to register your interest uh, in the opportunity. And then what comes next is the investment offer. Uh, where we're actually collecting investments. So if you have signed up as an expression of interest, the privilege of, of, of that means that you actually get early access to this opportunity before it goes live to the public. So for two days, the first two days, usually that it goes live, um, you'll have exclusive access, which is why you should sign up early if you haven't done so already to make sure um, you get that because we do see campaigns regularly sell out before they go live to the public. So anyone on the EOI list, gets first access to the opportunity. Um, investing through the platform, we've made it as easy as possible. We hope um, the key thing to keep in mind if you're interested in investing um, is to have a form of identification ready to go. So usually a driver's license is the easiest, um, easiest form of identi identity for us to verify. Um, we also take many different types of payment, uh, direct debit, bank transfer, BPAY, we can do all that sort of stuff. Um, so keep that in mind, but yeah, when you want to invest that's done through our platform and we've got various options for you to do so paying for your shares, you actually don't have to do this straight away. So if you invest in the first two days, you don't have to pay until the end of the campaign, which is usually two weeks away, uh, for everyone else, it's seven days payment terms. So just keep that in mind. You don't actually have to have the money straight away. Um, we'll reach out to you after you've made your application to collect payment. Um, like I said, a few days later in terms of getting the share certificate. So just to be clear, this is equity crowdfunding. So you're actually getting um, shares in the business. This is not like rewards crowdfunding where you're maybe you know, buying a pair of shoes. So you'll get your share certificates uh, usually two weeks after the campaign finishes because we have to make sure we've collected the funds. What we do then is we send Recycle Smart a list of people who've paid and they'll go ahead and issue the shares using a share registry provider. So you'll get an email about that after the campaign. Uh, if you ever want to cancel your investment, you have a five-day cooling off period after you make your application to do so. And like I said, you know, usually you haven't made payment by that stage. So it's a very straightforward process to cancel um, and five business days is the cooling off period. Uh, you certainly can invest through a self-managed super fund or company or trust. Um, there are a few nuances to that. So if anyone's looking to do that, just um, pop a question in the uh, question panel and I'll send you the relevant link, but that's all pretty straightforward. And finally, a uh, pretty important point is that to invest more than $10,000, you need what's called a wholesale shareholder certificate, which is a note from an accountant that says you've either got more than $250,000 a year in annual income or more than $2.5 million uh, in assets under management. For everyone else, the limit is $10,000, and that's just part of the, the rules and regulations um, set out by ASIC. So keep that in mind. Cool, that's me done. I'll stop sharing my screen now and I'll pass over to Giorgio to kick us off from Recycle Smart's presentation. Thank you very much, Martin. Let's see if I can share my screen <clears throat> and we go from there. All right, can you guys see that? All good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, look, um, where do we start? We started a few years ago, four years ago now, actually four years, 7th of July, 2019. That's when we started. 
Uh, he also started as an idea that Marco and myself were playing for probably the last 10 years. So we were really trying to find a solution around what to do with waste. How can we help people recycling better? How can we make it simple and easy? You know, How can we leverage tech to do it? We came up with you know, the, the, the first draft of you know, the, the system that we have now. And initially it was him and myself on my, that's my Vespa. So that's how we actually started. You know, it was actually real. You know? It was uh, collecting stuff into these bags, driving around and so on. We being ac accepted uh, as part of the first cohort of Antler in Sydney. Antler is a, one of the biggest, probably the biggest incubator now in the world. So we were part of the first cohort. We graduated from it and we got our first $100,000 investment to really try to make it happen. That's how we started. Um, today, we have, we have um, more than 30 drivers working with us. So quite of a difference from you know, the, the, the scooter to now having proper people collecting every day uh, around, around Sydney and, and, and South Australia. All righty, uh, next slide, here we go. So basically, what is the problem here? When you want to dispose items, things you don't want anymore, it's usually inconvenient, so it's, it's, it's not close to your place. You have all this polystyrene or you have you know, e-waste clothes. Where do you go with it? It's hard to find information. So, information. so if you go on your know, council website, there's a little PDF you need to download and there's like 55 pages and at the very bottom of it, hard. Confusing, different rules, different councils, different estates and so on. Contamination. People that they're like, all right, you know what? I don't know what to do with this. I just chuck in the bin. I put in the recycling bin, the yellow one, so it gets recycled, actually creates way more problems. It's called contamination. Putting wrong, wrong items into a bin. That creates massive problems for waste collection companies and councils as well. Critical situation. You probably guys are aware of it. Uh, it's on the news quite often. Uh, things like soft plastics are not being recycled. So packaging, anything that you scr can scrunch up made of oil and plastics. Um, Basically, the other big issues are batteries. So all small batteries, lithium batteries, anything that has batteries inside creates fire. When you put these batteries into cogs in a transfer station, uh, it can start fires. And it's costing millions of dollars to local government areas and, of course, us because we're paying uh, the tax rate at the end of the day. Um, the cost to the community is huge. We're talking about billions of dollars. We can dig into the numbers later, but it's a very, very large cost. So... One facility that burns down usually is at least a $50 million damage to start with. What do we collect? We collect four different types of items. Soft plastics, so anything that you can scrunch up. I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about you know, your packaging, your plastic bags, your films, and your plastic films, and so on. Clothes, wearable and unwearable, plus, plus accessories, uh, wearable and or not, so old shoes, we take them. E-waste, so anything with electricity inside, and misfits. Misfits is an interesting category that we invented to define the very long tail of items that you should never bring the bin and you actually don't know what to do with. Polystyrene, blister packs, bulbs, cookware, books, paint lids, and uh, uh, things full of paint and so on. There's a very long list of items. Uh, and so we do collect all of these weird things that you come across every day and you actually don't know what to do with. Just to give you a size of this, 30 to 40% of your daily waste production is something where we can collect and we can recycle. So it's a very large chunk of what you have in your bins every day. What is our value proposition? Well, from a council point of view, from your local government point of view, there's two things, right? Smaller red bins, so less stuff that goes to landfill and cleaner yellow bin. So basically having a recyclable bin, recycling bin that has the right stuff inside, not the wrong ones. Soft plastics is a big example of it. Data collection, we measure everything we take. We measure the weight and the type of items of everything we take for every pickup. That is a massive amount of information that is very useful for councils to predict the type of um, waste that will be disposed in the future. The other thing we do is we create local jobs. We recruit drivers in the local community driving around their own council and collecting items from their neighbors. Uh, usually it's, it's a part-time job. They are fully independent drivers. And we have uh, single moms, we have pensioners, we have students, we have a, a, lot, a big variety of people that are helping us collecting items. And so we, we definitely um, trade local jobs. Last one, plug and play. Because we are a tech solution, we can launch everywhere in Australia in two weeks. 
So it's a very quick implementation. It doesn't take years. It doesn't require massive investments in us in, in, in assets, uh, but it's very quickly and fast and, and scale, scale really quickly. Sorry. On the resident side, on the business side, it's simplicity. It's removing the friction of what do I do with all of these things? We're just taking it off. We make it so simple that you can't you can say, oh, it's complicated. I'm not going to do it. Chuck everything together in a single bag. We'll take care of it. Now, um, how does it work? Very simple. You put all of these items in a bag, any bag you have at home, any grocery shop bag, any paper bag, whatever you have, a classic you know, grocery shop bag size, 25 to 40 liters. Um, you go online, you book a pickup, either through our website or our app. After that, you can book a pickup for any time you want. One of our lovely independent drivers will come by, collect the bag, and, and divide the bags, so sort them out and take them to a recycling uh, center where they're gonna be disposed of or recycled. Data, we are doing, um, putting a lot, of, a lot of effort into collecting and harvesting all of this data that we have. Weight, type of items, pictures for everything we take. We know seasonality, we know different areas of a council, different type of people, students, families, because they're different type of waste. So it's actually really interesting to know um, what goes, what we collect, right? And we actually know a lot about it. Business model, it's quite simple, right? So council will pay for few bikes for their own, for their own residents. Um, in some areas where councils are supporting us, they provide one, two, three, four bags a month to their own residents. Otherwise, residents can pay for their own bags if the council is not supporting the, the program or if they want just one more bags. Um, we pay the local drivers per task. So we just make sure that they get paid for whatever job they do. Um, we deliver all the items into our recycling center, community recycling center, where we usually give them away for free or we actually even get a rebate for the different items that we dispose of. Um, to note that businesses will be the same thing. So if you're a business, Council is not paying for your pickups because you're supposed to pay for your own waste collection. So businesses paid us directly for the service. Market size. I'm going to just give you a few numbers to give you this, the understanding of how big is the opportunity. We can dig later into the numbers, but basically our opportunity in Australia is a $300 million opportunity in terms of revenue. Um, global market for recycling is actually $90 billion. Think about it. Everyone is a possible client with 30 to 40% of the waste production every day. So it's a huge, massive opportunity, right? Fraction to date. We've been working very hard to get here. And I'm actually very proud to share a few numbers that are growing very quickly. First of all, we are available in more than 20 council in, councils in Australia, between New South Wales and South Australia. We uh, cross the 1.1 uh, million annual recurring revenue. That means we make more than $1.1 million in revenue every year uh, with 40% margins. So actually the business does really well in terms of margins. We have more than 10,000 active users on our platform. That is a 25% increase from last quarter. So that's a really big increase. Um, we collected more than 140,000 bags of items since we started. Uh, sorry, in 2022, that is actually a 175% increase on the previous year in 2021. So big jump in terms of, uh, of progression. In total, that's why I said since we started, in total, we collected 470 tons of waste. These are 470 tons that didn't go to landfill, but they went to the right spot and were either reused, like wearable clothes, usually donated to charities, or recycled. We partner with a bunch of famous brands in Australia. We do some cross-marketing with them. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you know some of the brands up here. For example, you can buy uh, one of our if you want our bag from Aris, Aris Farm. So if you shop online in Sydney and or in Brisbane now as well, um, for your groceries and you want a bag, you can buy one of our beautiful pink bag. Um, that, talking about pink. Well, as you can see, we've been enjoying a lot of marketing from uh, councils, from uh, our partners, right? So that's actually a mall in Maitland where they had this big poster about Recycles Mall. We are on buses, we are on waste trucks. Waste trucks are actually very efficient because a waste truck enjoys 1 million pair of eyes every year in terms of marketing. And we, we don't pay for this. This is sponsored by local government areas. So that's actually great free marketing. In terms of traction, in terms of uh, reviews, I think now it's above 500, but I'm not sure about the number, but it's a lot of very positive reviews. The average 
um, or 641, I can read over there, sorry. So it's more than 500 and it's 4.9. So it's a really good, people are loving what we do, right? They detract, they, they, people like the product once they try it. Partnerships. This page is just a bit of uh, what we did in the last year. So ING did a promotion to their own uh, mortgage holder to promote our service. Um, Aris Farm is selling our beautiful pink bag that you can see there. Nothing. You do not need the bag to recycle. It's an addition if you like to have a bag, but you can use any bag you want. Canva is using us for their own offices. Canva is a great tech success story in Australia, and they're using Recycles Mark for collecting the items in the Sydney office for now. And I have a surprise for you guys later. Um, TV, we be actually featured thanks to our uh, collecting soft plastics and solving this problem. We've been on TV quite a bit lately. Uh, Channel 9 and ABC News, uh, where you can see our uh, great Ricky from our ops team discussing how we save soft plastics from landfill. Team, I'm going to fly over these. Everyone that is in the team is uh, great. It has a lot of experience in what it does. Uh, I come from some sort of management consulting plus waste uh, background. My co-founder, Marco, here has been building apps consumer-oriented for all of his life. For example, you know, a number of banking apps, a uh, number of government apps. So really trying to build a solution that is easy, uh, easy to read and easy to use for people, right? So that, that's kind of the, the space it comes from. Um, we have Fred, that is our consultant slash CFO running our numbers. Eugenie, our marketing officer with lots of experience in running marketing for um, um, consumer good companies. So that kind of, not, not, not waste, but like consumer goods, something that is appealing to users. Ricky, lots of experience in ops, so running our drivers. And Tosh is our sales guy that actually has a very niche experience. He's a sales guy that's been selling software to waste management um, councils for a long period of time. And he has a PhD in environmental science. When I hear PhD, I'm always very impressed because I think it's a lot of, lot of study. Um, advisory board. Well, Mark is all with us today. So Mark comes from, and he can say a few words about himself later if you guys want, but basically comes from the VC kind of um, profile. But the other two that we're very excited about, Justin is the former chief strategy officer for one of the biggest waste management companies in the world. Uh, and he's helping us uh, scaling up the business. And Jeremy actually is the co-founder of Milkran. I'm pretty sure that lots of you probably heard of it. Uh, Koala as well. Koala was, is the company that sells you mattresses online. So consumer-oriented um, companies. Competition. <clears throat> we sit probably in the best um, matrix if you mix type of items we collect and areas that we serve. There are other players trying a similar solution to us, but I would say that, uh, and please do your own due diligence and try the service as well if you like. I would say that we have probably three key advantages here. One, the data we collect. No one else is collecting data the way we do and knows what we know about, um, about uh, waste. Two, we are the only company that uses independent drivers. So we are leveraging the gig economy the same way Uber Eats does. That comes with a different kind of margins and a different kind of flexibility in scaling the business up. And the third one is the matrix of the, bro the, the, the broadness, sorry, the, the amount of items we collect in a single bag, uh, together with the, a, a very large area that we cover in terms of different councils. Today, I think it's 22 over there, but more than 20. So it's a very large area that we serve. Um, Great slide, classic, you know, classic slide that shows that we're going to go to the moon soon, and we will. Um, but just to give you some sort of key numbers, we're raising money now. One of the reasons we're doing it is to achieve finally break even at the end of next year. So that's our first goal. And the second goal is actually to get to $120 million in operating profit by end of financial year in 27. Um, very happy to discuss the numbers later with you guys if you have any specific questions about it. What are we doing with your funds? We're doing a few things. One, geographic expansion, launching the service from Sydney to Australia. Almost everywhere in Sydney now, definitely want to be everywhere else soon. For the expansion, there is a lot of stuff we can collect from your house um, in terms of items we can take. So it's definitely increasing the number of things we can take. So increasing that space or so becoming the one-stop shop for anything that you want to get rid of, that you want to return to someone. Channel expansion, so we tested B2C, so basically business to consumer, so um, basically 
you as a person paying for the bag and using the service. And we test this as well B2B. So recycling for your office, people like Canva paying um, to get rid of soft plastics in an office space. We want to roll this out because we noticed we, they were very successful trials. And what we want to do is just to roll out everywhere where we are actually active today. We want to reach profitability in the next year or so. Um, so really having a business that is making money, that is uh, breaking even. And then is investing in our tech for two reasons. One is definitely improving our operations, but the other one is to invest in the data side. We are, um, there's a lot that we can do in terms of harvesting data and, and then eventually um, packaging this data into something we need later. Um, there is one more thing that I want to share with you. I don't even know if, if actually Martin is aware of. We are launching, we are in Sydney today. We're launching in Melbourne the first week of July and we're launching in Brisbane by the end of August. So by the end of August, we're going to be in the three main cities in Australia. And the goal is to be in every capital city by the end of this uh, calendar year. So hopefully all of you soon will be able to use RecycleSmart at home to get rid of your stuff. Join our uh, community of 37,000 people that are supporting us and help us scaling this business across Australia. Make sure that everyone has access to a service that is really easy to use and, make you, and makes recycling finally Simple and almost funny, if you if you pardon me. Like our pink color is quite cool. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Giorgio. Uh, covered a lot of really good ground there. And I see we've got plenty of questions, which I'll jump into very shortly. Yeah. Um, like I said, anyone who has a question, please pop it in there. We'll try and get through as many as we can tonight and upvote the ones you want answered. Uh, we've got more than 100 participants on tonight's call. So great that everyone's um, turned out to hear about this uh, exciting opportunity. Um, Georgia, before we crack on, do you want to stop sharing your screen and then we'll um, get uh, the panelists up? There we go. Cool. I'll jump into the first question in terms of the most upvotes. So from Joss he here, who's asking, what do you pay your independent drivers I'd like to know that a company I'm investing in does not exploit workers as Uber drivers are exploited. Who wants yeah, to that one? For, yeah I'll, I'll pick that one and then I'll let Georgia complete my answer if uh, necessary. Uh, thank you for this question. It's a really, really great question. So the way we uh, remunerate, remunerate our um, drivers is we pay them for tasks. So a task is a pickup completed um yeah. and overall because that, that that number will not really translate to you uh roughly it means that they could make between 30 and 40 dollars per hour um which is uh like a, a fair uh number we believe um and as Jojo mentioned we also offer them very flexible conditions of work um and it's quite a convenient um timing for them because like we we work from like 8 a.m until 2 p.m usually um yeah so that's and from monday to friday and I'll put another point on there. We have a great retention of drivers. Drivers have been with us since we started four years ago. Like the guy in, in uh, right from, from, um, from North Shore, right? So there are some people that have been working with us for a long time. They appreciate what we do. And so definitely we pay them above what is the right thing. Um, and uh, we had issues where they're getting chocolates at Christmas from users because they start knowing each other. And it's the same guy for such a long period of time that they get like little cookies we have pictures about it yes we do <laughs> added perks of the job that's always good um cool we'll, we'll just crack on with the quick questions we've got a fair few uh flowing through and, and thanks everyone for upvoting this does help us prioritize so keep that going karen here is asking i'm interested in the actual recycling process and what are the end uses of the recycled products yeah, uh, really good question as well. Thank you. Um, so just to, to clarify here, because I, I see a, a few questions on that topic. Um, so we don't recycle anything ourselves. We work with partners, with recycling recycling partners. Um, and obviously, with the extent of a number of items we collect, the recycling process will be different from an item to another. Um, so I might just jump in straight into the soft plastics because I have a feeling this is the most topical um, item that we collect at the moment. So for soft plastics, we have a partnership with APR Plastics. Um, it's a recycling facility based in Victoria, and um, they use a very specific method to turn those soft plastics back into oil. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we have this partnership with them, and then this oil can be then refined. Um, they have a specific partnership with Viva Energy, and the idea is for that oil to be then turned back into um, plastic pellets and ends of plastics. And if I can just add on top of it, uh, thank you, Eugenie, for that. Sorry, Martin. I think this is really important, right? Soft plastics, polystyrene, and so on. 
What we really do is two things. One, we ensure that the partners we work with, we do auditing on them and we make sure there is a lot of transparency and providing you data about what happened to it. It really makes sure they're great companies to work with. And the second bit is that we focus on the collection. So we can always partner with whoever is the best person or companies to process a specific stream. So they give us a lot of flexibility in always working with the best solution that, from an environmental point of view, from, from anything, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, and actually, like I can give a few more details because I'm going to be short in my answer. So that was of plastics. We can go through like the, the four main categories. So for clothes, if they are in wearable condition, we'll be donating them to local charities. So we have a preferred partnership with Australian Red Cross. Um, otherwise, we can use like any charity that makes sense from a routing perspective for our drivers. Um, and then uh, for non wearable clothes, we have a partnership with Upcycle for Better that will then, depending on the condition, turn that into different material uh, from isolation material to building material. Material, um, and so on. And then e-waste uh, is dismantled. Uh, it is the one stream that has the most value and then every single component can be used again. Um, so you can have like the copper, the plastic and um, all those little things in e-waste. And then for misfits, I won't go through the whole list, but I can take the example of the um, coffee capsules, for example, um, where the aluminum and the coffee ground are separated. Uh, the coffee ground is used in composting and then the aluminum is just turned back into aluminum because that's a material that's infinitely recyclable. Awesome. That's it. And this is maybe gives us another point about the whole idea, right? In reality, if you divide each single stream, you segregate items by themselves, there is value. You know, coffee ground by itself is actually really good for composting. Aluminium by itself is recyclable. The issue is that when it's mixed, and that's where our drivers add a lot of value to the process because they're separating for you as a user all of these items in specific niche categories, cables, mobile phone batteries, you know, like the, the niche of the niche of the niche. And once you have the specific type of item, like blister packs by themselves, you can create something out of it. You can really reuse it somehow. If yeah. you mix them up, it's a it's landfill. Yeah, thanks. Good to know. Really important topic to get into. Um, and thanks for all the detail there. Like I've, I've still got a toaster and a Nutribullet sitting in my garage for the last six months, which I have been meaning to recycle, but I've never got around to it. So um, when are you booking? <laughs> <laughs> when are you launching in Melbourne? I'll be the first customer. So be good. Um, all right, Luke here. Second uh, July. There we go. Second <laughs> July. Put it in the calendar. Um, Luke here is asking: Is medical waste an area of recycling you may want to expand into? Uh, yeah, so for, for that one, we are constantly looking into new areas. Um, so we, I, I could say, yes, for, for now, to be perfect, transparent, it's not on our top list of items that we're going to add uh, soon. Um, maybe because we're a bit afraid of like all the components around in terms of safety. Um, so we need to figure this out, but definitely our goal uh, is, is to add as many items as we can. So yeah, absolutely. Adding on that as well, medical can be divided into two. Pharmaceutical stuff, we do take it. All pharma, all pharma, all medicines, we can take it. Blister packs, we can take it. Hazardous medical material has a lot of regulation and therefore some of the items, we won't be able to collect them because they come with specific rules around it. For safety of our drivers, we only take stuff that is inert and is not dangerous. For example, we do not take any bottle with liquid inside because we don't know what the liquid could be. So when we find something in front of your house that is something that we can take, and clearly we state what we don't take, we leave where it is and we provide you through our customer care system, you know, an email, a message, the best option where you can go and get rid of it in a sustainable way. But still, we only collect items that are safe for our drivers and do not create issues um, down the road, we actually agreed the list with EPA in New South Wales to really make sure that whatever we collect, it's safe by itself and can be recycled by our recyclers. Yeah, yeah, that's a really important point. Um, Caroline here is asking, how do you know that re the recycling facilities are actually recycling things, e.g. how do you ensure you don't have a scenario like a red cycle? Um, I guess maybe just for everyone's um, you know, uh, background knowledge, and maybe if you can go into detail about the, the issues with the red cycle, that'd be good as well. Yeah. I'll take that one. Um, all right, so right cycle. I think everyone here has in mind what happened. So there's been a, what we call the collapse of the right cycle program um, because they have not been able to find a downstream for the product that they were making out of the soft plastics. Um, they were consolidated in, in like uh, big warehouses in an attempt to then be processed, but the volume became too um, big uh, for it to be processed by the partner recyclers they had, which were uh, turning those um, into different products such as 
as wall stops, um, bollards, um, park benches, etc. Um, there's also been a fire at a facility from one of their recyclers that was supposed to use that um, into asphalt. Uh, so that didn't help at all the steam, but um, that the stock fighting has been happening for a few years. Um, so how are we different from that? Um, so we do have this partnership with API that I was mentioning before. Um, the end product is completely different because it's a real like um, circular economy outcome. Soft plastics are, are turned back into oil, and this oil can then be refined and turned back into soft plastics again. Um, and actually, what happened very recently, I think it was this week, a bit less in my days, um, but the fact that the government has announced that there will be mandatory requirements for manufacturers to use a percentage of recycled content in them in their packaging is great news as well for that reason, um, because recycling is useless if no one actually buys the outcome of it. Um, and the better recycling uh, stream is the one that is not downcycling anything into something that will end up being a downside product, but in something that can be reused in the same way. Um, so yeah, that would be kind of our main difference on that on that note. The other thing that differentiates us from Recycle is that we uh, we control how much we collect. Um, and so we have this agreement in place with APR. We've taken a very slow approach at the beginning to make sure that everything could be accepted by them. Um, and like we are monitoring that with them and making sure that everything that we are shipping to them uh, regularly, um, they, they can actually handle. That's the point. We do not store items compared to other companies. We don't store it. We collect and we give it straight away to a processor. And therefore, we're never going to have a pile of stuff in a warehouse that we don't know what to do with because we just don't do it. And the other thing is by partnering with people, we can change partnership we have if we have to. But definitely not having a store or like a, a place where we store it uh, ensures that we're never going to end up with a big chunk of so plastics that we don't know what to do with. Yeah, great to know there's a solution uh, now that Red Cycle is no longer with us. I'm still just naturally uh, putting my soft plastics to one side, even though there's nothing I can do with them down here in Victoria um until the 2nd of july when you guys come um nicholas here has a big question you're making me work hard here nicholas i'll try and do my best to get this out um this one might be one for you mark um so it's mentioning here that you have margins of 40 percent how do you expect margins will change over time do you have a specific target in mind um i mean there's like four separate questions here i think we might just start with that first one and then we'll we'll see how we go yeah sure good good question um so uh, I'll, I'll probably work backwards on, on that question. So a target is probably around 50% uh, gross margins. And we've actually got as high as 58% gross margins uh, this year. Um, in terms of them changing over time, as the business grows, what then happens is the density increases. So the collections become closer together. Drivers can uh, collect more bags in a shorter amount of time, which then will increase our, our gross margins as well. So um, hopefully that answers that question. I'm, I'm actually looking at the rest of the question here, Martin, trying to make your life a bit easier. Um, so it, in terms of future capital raises um, and using the use of funds, so the, the funds that we're raising now, it, it, really the aim is to get us to break even. Uh, and once we get to break even, obviously, then we are customer funded rather than being investor funded uh, moving forwards after that. Um, I think the, the, it's likely that another capital raise will happen to enable the company to expand overseas. Um, but the aim is to get to break even, um, uh, as Roger mentioned, by uh, within the next 12 to, to 18 months. Um, I think that last bit, legal or regulatory considerations, um, I, I might hand over to Giorgio for uh, that last bit of that question. Giorgio? Yeah, what is the, I, I can't, where is the question? Sorry. Uh, are, are there any legal or regulatory considerations that could impact the company's operations or growth plans? So, um, we spoke actually we are engaging quite a bit with different regulators both a federal level and a state level and a council level of course by working with councils we have to do that um the stuff we collect so there's two things here one by using drivers with their own car we are below any commercial limit consider commercial limit so we can definitely take all of these items 
And the second bit are because they're small quantities. So they're not dangerous, they're small quantities, they're not storing it. The second piece around it is on the um, type of items that, as I mentioned before, were discussed and approved, if you want, in a conversation, very open conversation with EPA, which we have a constant communication every six months, just to make sure that whatever we do is still in the frame of um, of, of the you know the, the law of New South Wales and of course Australia. But just to give you a data point, if you do work with council, there is a long list of things you need to do. Work health and safety, uh, operations plan, and 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 you know uh, drivers training and so on that we have to go through before a council actually approves what we do. So I would just say, long story short, by working with the government, you have to stick to rules; otherwise, you are in trouble. Yeah, and uh, just on those other questions, Nicholas, there about uh, use of funds and future capital raising, I just want to also highlight that the offer document is going to be available to everyone when the investment offer goes live um, in a little while, that has all the details in terms of use of funds, you know, current financial statements, all the, the extra information you might be looking for will be available to everyone on this call. Um, I don't think I pointed that out clearly at the start, so just wanted to highlight that again. Cool, and thanks everyone for all the questions. We've got 45 open questions. We're doing our best to get through them. I think upvoting is probably the best way to make sure we're getting to the ones everyone wants answered. So keep hitting those thumbs up, please. Um, and we'll crack on. So April here is asking about the setup in regional areas where there might be limited recycling facilities. How, how would you then plan to get items to the appropriate services if they're not already in the community? Georgia, I saw you very good. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> we, big question, right? So Australia definitely focusing on, on, on metro area because of volumes. But we actually tested and we are working in rural areas, Mightland, for example, in the Hunter Valley. Um, so by having independent drivers working in their own specific area, this the way we did in, in Mightland, for example, there are three major centers. So each center has its own driver doing a couple of hours a day and therefore is not driving that much. What it would do then is we use council's collection points. So basically warehouses, they're not accessible to the public, but council owns land and warehouses around you know, they're on the council, basically, where drivers can store items for a few days until they have enough quantities to transfer it to the recycling center run by the council. So we actually, uh, we are open already, we are available in Maitland, and we have a, definitely a lot of conversation in the Northern Rivers, uh, where we hopefully we're going to be available soon, um, and a bunch of other regional councils in central, central New South Wales. Uh, long story short, uh, definitely rural is something that we can do and we would love to as well, because these are the areas where they have the least amount of options, where we can really add a lot of value by having partnership there on a, on a national scale, uh, while the council in central New South Wales might not have a partnership for polystyrene, for example. Yeah, yeah, good to know, good to know. Um, all righty, Defar here is asking, what are you doing to support reduction in consumption and behavior change in consumption to reduce the amount that needs to be recycled in the first place um, and advocating for better quality manufacturing? Ellie here has also mentioned that, um, you know, recycling might sounds like a great uh, answer to the problem, but I'd love to know what they're doing to address the cause in the first place. Yes, I'll jump into that question very happily because that's one that's very close to my heart. Um, we are really like, uh, especially in the in my team, but uh, the overall business passionate about what we call the, the waste hierarchy, uh, which is like first you need to reduce uh, slash refuse, second reuse, and recycle only comes third. Um, so that really is the the standing point that we have. Um, we in all the ways that we connect with what we call our recycle heroes, which is our community of um, engaged users or just like followers um, of people. We constantly give tips and tricks, yes, on how to recycle better, um, that's for sure, but also on how to reduce and reuse more. Um, so we really have that ingrained in us. We want people to uh, first try and avoid the things that they consume. And we we try things ourselves. We share our tips and tricks with them very regularly. Um, so that that's the main thing that we're doing on that topic because we're very conscious of that too. And if I can add something on that, like, I mean, this is something that's very close to my heart as well. As you as you as you probably understood, like we are creating an infrastructure of like of uh, of accessibility in that sense, right? Like, and we are confident that also like with time in the future, uh, recycle not recyclers producers like will be able to access this new infrastructure that we are putting in place, and and be conscious about it when they are creating new products. So they will be be able to put in the market and knowing that there is another way to reuse or like to be able to. Uh, 
access like a new infrastructure for recycling that is going to be different for the existing ones. So they don't have to go immediately with like a, a, the existing packaging. I'm gonna uh, create a package that then will be thrown away. But maybe there is like a, this will also enhance the re, a different like a thinking in that sense, if it makes sense. Yeah, and we, yeah, this is also like why we, we create this company in a sense. 100%, 100%. Yeah, having lived in a few different parts of Australia and how different all the recycling systems are, um, it's great that you guys are kind of bringing that all together with efficiency. Um, we'll keep cracking on with the questions. Like I said earlier, this webinar is being recorded. So um, if you have to jump off, we'll have a copy of the recording soon as well. Um, we can run a little bit over time, which we might do just to see if we can get through as many questions as possible. Yep. Um, we might go 10 minutes over tonight. So Karen here is asking, can you drop off soft plastics to your facility yourself? Let's say if you have lots of them um, to save, uh, you know, without buying the bags. Yes, um, that's a question that we get uh, from time to time. Uh, the answer, unfortunately, is no, uh, because the uh, consideration point that we have that Georgia was mentioning are not accessible to the public. Um, so you have to book a pickup for us to come and collect it. The other reason why we're doing that is because one key added value that we have in the recycling chain is that our drivers are doing the sorting. So we make sure that all the streams that we collect are free of contamination. Um, and we will not be able to do that if we were um, accepting huge amounts in like in a drop of collection yeah good to know good to know um just, just, just on top of it one of the issues with recycle was that people at the supermarket would chuck anything inside the bins right so the quality of the soft plastics that we're getting was definitely not close to what we do what we take is 100 percent soft plastics and can be processed straight away so any item we take for example cardboard goes straight to a paper mill if you have a public drop-off that is not monitored then is when you start getting bunch of things and contamination destroys value in it so then you're back to the story of the bean right yeah yeah, yeah. Can, we can all and, and the last one on that bit sorry is that from an efficiency perspective like it will be more efficient to have uh, one driver collecting from 20 people and then doing that last bit that last mile logistics in one go instead of having like 20 people driving their own car with a few soft plastics at the back um and then going to a drop off point yeah yeah i can definitely see how the drivers act as that um you know they're, they're checking the quality um, you know, if anyone's driven past like a, a Salvation Army store in the morning and seeing all the stuff that's been dumped there overnight, you'd appreciate the need for that. Um, because it's also like about. another aspect, which is very important as well, which is uh, like, I mean, this, the single responsibility, the fact that like there's, as we were mentioning before, like the stickiness of the drivers, like, I mean, the, it creates really like a personal engagement with, uh, with, with whoever like is coming and collect these items, right? There's, this instills like in people's a different relationship with 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 what they're doing it is not like throwing stuff and forget about it it's actually okay like if someone is taking coming on your place like and, and and doing like a real close job with me it's not something that happens uh, only god knows where like in the desert like it's it's real close and this creates a, such as like a sense of responsibility that like is is a key driver of like the successful of this of this service yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think if anyone's appreciated uh, trying to get recycling um, going in your household or your office, uh, having someone there to, to check everyone is always a good thing. Um, Alice here is asking, although every household could take this up, what does your research tell you is the size of the market that would actually use and pay for this service? And over to Mark, just to speak a little. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so I think when Giorgio was going through the presentation, there was a slide there that spoke to uh, the size of the market that we've estimated in Australia. Um, and we've done that by looking at the number of households in, uh, in, that are accessible, so in urban areas, and then added the number of businesses as well. Um, and then we've estimated that, that, that about 10% of those would, would look to use the service. Um, so that's how we've, we've come to the, uh, the, the, the figure in terms of the size of the market in Australia. Um, from our, our research, we've also uh, estimated how many bags those, those um, residents and businesses would be uh, looking to have collected um, and then applied uh, that, our charge per bag to that. And that comes to uh, the $300 million uh, that Giorgio mentioned before. Um, hopefully that answers the, the question. The question has now disappeared, but... Um, yeah, that's how we how we got to those numbers. Uh, like Martin said, there's a lot more information in the uh, offer document uh, that'll be coming out soon. Yeah, stay tuned for that one. 
Uh, question here from Chloe, which I can jump into quickly. So Chloe is saying, aside from investing in a company that has environmental values at heart, what are the financial slash tangible benefits to shareholders? Are there dividends or will there be dividends uh, reinvestment plans? So in terms of early stage investments, all the companies we see through Birchwell are at early stages, dividends doesn't really make a lot of sense because you know reinvesting those profits in the business for growth is, is usually the trajectory that a lot of businesses are on. Um, so most of the companies that we deal with in terms of returns to investors, they're looking at uh, exits in the form of either a listing on the stock exchange or an acquisition. To give you two tangible examples of where this has happened before, uh, Car Next Door is a company in Sydney that did an equity crowdfunding round and a year later they were bought by Uber. Now it's Uber Car Share. Um, and for Virtual, we had a company called Biomi, which uh, did a raise with us uh, in 2020, and then they listed on the stock exchange uh, a couple of years later. As you can appreciate with uh, industry only being going since 2018, we're talking about long-term time horizons here. So most companies need a few years to kind of get to that point, um, but those are the, usually the exit plans. So um, thanks for your question, Chloe, but that's just a bit of background for this type of investing here. Um, Annie here is asking, what is the risk to the business if councils suddenly change their mind about support? Yeah, can I take it? Oh, right. Sorry, I was like, Georgia, you go. <laughs> yeah, so there's two points there, right? Point number one is, it's very hard for councils to take away something they give you, right? It's quite sticky. Once you like it as a user, if you like it, and if as a resident, uh, then councils stop doing it, there will be a lot of pushback right that's one two is fantastic even if they stop doing it that's exactly why now we're launching b2c everywhere in australia so we don't need to wait or have councils necessarily on board we would love to engage them that's how we got up to here right so it's a great way to kick start a business but we believe the future is actually direct to consumer and direct to businesses right because that traction is completely different we've been blown out by the response that we had in our test um so we believe that councils on board is great it's supporting us in terms of marketing of like a minimum fee they pay every month, but the opportunity definitely sits into the business to direct to business and direct to consumer. Yeah. Mark, if you, I forgot anything since you are our number guy. No, 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 I think you, I think you covered it very well. Yeah. Um, Sophie here has asked, are you working towards minimizing the emissions associated with pickups, e.g. loans for the drivers to get electric cars or scooters? or maybe providing some small electric vehicles for pickups? Yes, great question. Um, so at the moment, the way we are um, trying to minimize our emissions is through the optimization of the routes. I'll, I'll hand over to Marco in a second. Uh, the other thing I can tell on that topic, so for now, uh, we are not looking into electrical cars, electric scooters, uh, but that would be on the roadmap um, at some point, uh, but just not right now. Um, and the other thing before I let you, Marco, um, is that, it's not as good as reducing, but we're also offsetting all our emissions um, as we're a carbon neutral company. Um, Marco, yeah, the optimization? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we're trying uh, our best from a, I mean, from a technical point of view to uh, to enable our drivers to stay as little as possible on the road and as well, like, I mean, clustering as many pickups in the same area as much as possible. That's why, like, I mean, if you try in the service, like sometimes you get to schedule with like, long time like in advance so you always have like time to prepare but yeah that's that's what we moving towards as much as possible again because the, the least amount of uh, uh, travel that like our drivers have to do the better outcome is it is built from a financial point of view from the mental point of view and so so much of food so yeah yeah get a few more vespers like the the early days and you'll be right um patty o'donnell here has asked uh for investors what's the exit plan and timing when do you anticipate to get dividends so again i'll jump in here i sort of answered it last time around we are a bit limited in terms of what we can say about um you know exit plans and timings just based on the regulations and because we're, we're talking about a financial um, product here and service uh, but like I said before, the main exits for most businesses is not dividends in terms of returns to investors. It's either an acquisition or an IPO. And I gave you some examples of um, previous ones that have done equity crowdfunding there. Um, Hien is asking, do you collect data relating to carbon costs, uh, carbon cost of the collection process? I think we kind of covered that before, but maybe on the data uh, side of things, was there anything to add to that? Well, I mean, uh, not that much in that sense. Like, I mean, uh, the collection process, like, is definitely big, and uh, and 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 it's it's hard to 
sort of like break it down to only one number also because of the variety of things that we collect and if you want to drill down to that like it's definitely a challenge but we are planning to work actually we're engaging with the university as well in order to come up with like a plan to be able to deliver a much more solid impact sort of uh, set of metrics that can uh, sort of like uh, be a better indicator of, of, of what our operations are like in that sense yeah for sure um cool i'm just going to keep uh whipping through the questions apologies if it seems like we're, we're moving pretty fast but we do have 51 open questions so we're going to do our best to get through as many as we can um there's going to be a lot of other forums for for um, people to connect with the recycle smart team which we'll cover shortly really appreciate everyone who's sticking around and who's asking questions we've got still around 100 people on the call which is great um plenty of uh, interest for sure so karen here is asking can you quantify the proportion of microplastics that are created during the recycling process in your recycling facility particularly from soft plastics you might not have the data on this but is there any uh, details you can provide there to karen yes so uh, i i don't have the, the data and um i will definitely research that my understanding and what we've been uh, going through in details with api plastics that the process um of recycling soft plastic that they use, which is uh, through bringing those at very high temperature without oxygen, creates only like two byproducts. One is the oil and the other one is carbon ash. Um, so we've not mentioned anything about um, microplastics um, because of that process, but I'll just make sure that we got that right because um, that's a very important question. There's been a bit, um, a few things in the press lately about that um, problem. Um, but yeah, so my understanding so far, and I'll confirm that, is oil and black ash that are the two byproducts and the only two ones. Yeah, good to know, good to know. Um, District here is asking, uh, can you talk about your partnerships with APR Plastics? partnership okay. i'm feeling i have covered that one martin already yeah, you did um, detail yeah feel free to skip over it we can move yeah on I, I will like um I, on that topic actually um if i haven't been in depth and just being conscious of the 50 questions we have left um we have a specific page on our website where we actually explain everything how it works you can even see a video of the process itself so like feel free to uh, to have a look um and we'll, we'll definitely share that with you uh in the activity update on the virtual page Good to know. Um, Sandeep here is asking, on the earlier side, you mentioned Antler. Can you provide some details on how much investment you received from them? What were the funds used and why not use Antler to obtain additional funds? Again, I'll just also point out that Opera Document will have details on other investors. But if you want to talk about the Antler investment sort of relationship, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, Mark, are, Mark. You, sure. Um, so, um, yeah, Georgia mentioned that uh, the company went through Antler's uh, accelerator pro program, uh, in, in fact, the first cohort uh, that Antler run uh, in Australia. Um, and they did then invest in subsequent rounds. So uh, it wasn't just a one off. They, they did follow on. But Antler, uh, up until very recently, only invest in very early stage companies as companies are starting out. Um, so there is a cutoff point uh, after which they don't tend to continue to fund um, their portfolio companies, uh, but they've been extremely supportive. Um, they've uh, we've got um, we've got some supporting media uh, of this campaign as well from Antler uh, that's that, that's uh, that, that's been shared as well. Um, and yeah, like Martin said, uh, more detail in terms of how much they've invested is in the offer document coming out. Yeah, definitely. From our perspective, it's a great investment uh, partner to have. Antler is global, um, you know, hundreds of startups in their portfolio. Um, so we definitely, when we see companies that have gone through Antler and have Antler as an investor, it's definitely a big tick from, from our end for sure. Um, Simone here is, is asking, I think I read somewhere on the website that free collectibles occur every six to eight weeks per client sponsored by the local council. As a customer myself, I have seen this stretch out now to five months. Does the council issue a bucket of money that you divide per quantity of residence or do you charge the council per customer um, with the photos and data you're collecting? I'm not too sure how much detail you can go to there, but yeah, if you could um, give Simone some response, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Uh, I can give a quick, a quick answer. So the way it works for the council is that they pay us a, um, a set fee that enables us to collect a certain number of free bags each month. Um, so depending on the amount of demand that we have, uh, we allocate those free bags. Um, so the more people we have wanting to get 
free bags collected by us, um, the more we have to space them apart to make sure that we um, we fit in the budget. Um, and so that's uh, one of the reasons why we also have these two extra offers where people can actually pay for extra bags or even jump onto a monthly subscription that they will pay for uh, to kind of cover the gaps uh, between the, the free allocation that they receive from the council and their actual recycling needs. Cool, thanks for that. Um, Suzanne here is asking if the collector is doing the sorting, how do they get the divided goods to the right end recycler? And how do you know if they have put the stuff in, in the bin? I guess maybe the correct bin or not. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a that's a really good question so actually um so the drivers collect the bags they sort everything at the back of their car once their car is full and depending on their router um they will drop off in the right location um so the locations depend on the councils and all their items sometimes it's um in the council recycling center or sometimes it's at own consolidation point or sometimes when it's convenient it's directly at the recycler um, and the way we make sure that they actually uh, drop off everything is mainly through training um, and also because we monitor what's going on in the consolidation points and through our recyclers. Um, so our drivers are vetted and trained. Um, as Georgia mentioned, they are really sticky. They really care about what they do. So there's a really high level of trust with them. Um, and uh, yeah, I would guess that's our answer. If um, Mark or Georgia, you want to add anything? Um, like I said, we'll go for a few more minutes. We'll probably go to 7.10. Uh, um, if anyone has to run off now and you haven't had a question answered, there is a lot of options for reaching out directly to the Recycle Smart team. And I, I know they've been calling a lot of people. Um, there'll be details in the email follow-up you'll get after this webinar about the best contact point. Uh, but if you do have to run off, I also just want to highlight that there will be another webinar occurring next Thursday at the same time because we have had so many questions and so much interest in this opportunity. So if you have to run off now, I just wanted to flag that with you early. But we'll keep going until uh, 10 past and we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. Uh, we obviously won't get through all of them tonight. Um, but yeah, there'll be plenty of other opportunities to engage with the team here. So Paddy has asked a question asking, how many councils do you plan to sign up in the next 12 months? Giorgio, is this one for you? You're mute, but we're ready to leave. Said plenty. I say this is Mark, now a number guy. I'm happy to take it if you don't want to. There you go. Um, well, maybe you can comment after me and Giorgio. Um, but I, I, I think it was Paddy uh, who answered the question. Um, so Paddy, I think the, the the main focus for the for the business over the next 12 months is definitely shifting away from signing up councils and it's moving into what is a much it's a it's a very uncapped opportunity, um, which is the direct to consumer and the business to business opportunity. Um, it's a much shorter uh, sales cycle as well. Um, you know, we can sign up new users very very quickly, and there's there's um, there's the, the opportunity is much larger. So that is definitely like Giorgio said that the model was proved through the model and the demand were proved through uh, going to to councils. Uh, now there is a shift. Um, to go direct to consumers and to business. Uh, Georgia, I don't know if you want to comment um, on- I think it's great. We still want to win council. We're still working on it. We got an amazing sales guy that has a specific, you know, understanding of how to sell to council. So hopefully way more than now. Um, we have a few projections that you're probably going to see in the other offer document, but this is definitely not the focus of why we're raising money now. We could have done it, you know, just keep going by ourselves. The reason we're raising money now is to explore and really, not explore, actually roll out the opportunity to be direct to consumer and direct to business everywhere in Australia in the next few months. I saw a few questions about when we're going where. As we said before, Melbourne, the first of, second of July, whenever it is, Gary Martin. Um, uh, Brisbane, the end of August. Every other capital city in Australia by the end of the year. And then, of course, keep going everywhere any regional broom actually you won't believe it we got people from broom asking us to recycle stuff so it's good to see that you know like you have all of this demand from everywhere it's not just a city thing yeah definitely it's a problem everywhere um so yeah i can definitely see why there's uh, so many people asking um and yeah i'll get that uh, that toaster and that uh, neutral bullet to you shortly don't worry about that um pete here is asking about vapes uh considering these have lithium batteries in them they're <laughs> a huge problem do you uh, collect them 
Yeah, I'll jump in just to annoy Giorgio. Yes, we do. Uh, since which day are we today? Since yesterday. Um, so we now collect vapes. We announced it yesterday um, to our Recycle Heroes and today on social media. Um, and we are um, very happy to do so because that's one item that uh, we kept on having a lot of questions about. It's a bit tricky because it's kind of a mixture of plastic, obviously, batteries, but also liquid. Um, but we have found one of our partner recyclers that can actually take them, dismantle them, and then um, send different parts to different recyclers to turn that into new resource. So yes. Good to know, good to know. But please make sure you don't- And, and there is a video coming of a friend of mine saying that we collect vapes on social media soon, right? Yeah, so we, we're gonna spread the word. Yeah, can we take that off? We can do vaping, um, you know, but yeah. Yeah, without encouraging vaping, by the way. You are doing it at least recycle the vapes. That's, that's, that's All that's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, Frederica here is asking, what are the weaknesses of your model and uh, what are the key risks and how do you intend to manage them? Jojo and Mark. Do you want me to take it, Mark, or you want to do it? You can go first. All right. <laughs> so, of course, there's a risk, right? Like, as anything in life. Uh, I think we build some moats around it. Um, First of all, the tech side of it, uh, it's been a lot of work for many years, so it's not easily replicable. It can be replicable, but it's not that easy to, to be done. Two is the mouth around the relationship that we have with local government areas. As I said before, very sticky. So if you work with a council, usually you keep working with them for a long time. And the third one is the network effect. The more people use the service, the more people are just going to use the recycles and not other additional services. But I would say that's, that's the risk that any business can have. Mark, or I think you can comment on this. Um, yeah, as Giorgio said, that I mean there there is there's a, a a risk there to every business. Um, in terms of um, moats, in addition to what Giorgio uh, spoke about, um, I think that um, we have a a, a great brand, um, and there a lot of people can relate to that brand and the 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 marketing element and the social media and. Don't know if you, everyone picked up on it, but there are thirty-seven thousand people that are engaged with the with the company. Uh, you know, Re the Recycle Heroes. Um, that's that's not something that you can buy overnight. So that has taken years to build, um, and that provides uh, you know a, a great moat to any competitor trying to come in um, and rep replicate the business. Um, and there have been rep competitors come in, uh, but I think that just proves that there's a market there um which is which is a good thing the other thing is a uh, mark mark was looking at me like that and i don't know what he means data we are probably the only player in the market and one of the i mean i don't know anyone that's doing it the amount of data we collect is huge and definitely has value we didn't explore it yet but we know that we know a lot about it uh, and that really creates a mouth in terms of uh people that want to engage us to provide a service so yeah, ju yeah just to, just to add to that there's there's no one that has access to the same data or data um, as we do in terms of uh, doorstep uh, recycling. Um, so there, there is a huge amount of value to that. Um, and it's something that currently we provide to councils, which helps councils uh, plan and monitor the recycling habit habits within um, their area. But um, there are other uses uh, and benefits to that data as well. And uh, yeah, no one else has access to that data so uh, that's a huge moat as well uh, going forwards. Cool. Cool. And uh, I think we'll go to quarter past seven just to round it off at a nice even number. So we'll get through a few more questions. Um, Louise here is asking and one I can answer. So is there a liability to shareholders if the company goes bust? No, because you are a shareholder. Um, so there's no liability except for the, obviously the money you put in in terms of shares. Um, but yeah, don't worry about uh, any uh, debt collectors knocking on your door in the future. That won't happen. Um, Cameron here is asking from a financial perspective, how do you compete with free collection services being offered by some competitors? Is there a plan moving forward to push the point of difference? Sorry, um, do I take it and I pass it to Eugene, you want to take it? Yeah, no, you go. Good. So uh, free service, we are a free service as well. So depending depending the council, that if the council pays for it, we are free as well, right? So someone is paying for it. It's not free by itself. Um, someone is paying for the service, usually the council or people by themselves. Uh, we do have that advantage as well. So in some councils, um, you are able to book two bags every four weeks. 
um, in some areas a bit less than that. Um, so yes, we are a free service as well if the council supports it. So that's how we compete with our competitors in the sense. Um, but we offer the opportunity for you to pay if you want it like more often, or if you are in a council that doesn't have, they don't support uh, home collection, basically, those type collection. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yes, it does. I will just add two things. Um, at the moment, from what we see, we also have the longest uh, tail of items that we collect, um, um, and we keep on adding new items, and that's something that our customers really love, um, that we're constantly adding those items to make sure that we recycle the, the most things. And we also um, feed um, data back to you so you can actually measure, like follow up your impact uh, in your account, and that is quite rewarding because that we're talking about recycling, right? So people are paying for something that they don't really get anything from it. Um, so that's kind of our way to give back, um, giving them more data they can share with their neighbors, their friends, and uh, really measure how much waste they're saving from landfill resources. Um, and the last bit is that um, we have, as Mark was mentioning, a strong brand um, that people actually really love and they follow us and we engage with them. And I think that also um, a really good retention tool. And last point on this, that I think is really important. We are the only company that has no interest, no financial interest, in processing items. We are not a we, um, clothing processing company that now comes and collect clothes from your house and a bit of something else with it. We have no interest in focusing on a specific stream. What we're focusing on is just the collection bit and make it simple for you. And that's why we have this huge long list of items because we don't make money out of the um, items we collect. We get some rebates every now and then, but it's not the focus of the business. The focus is on the collection part of it. And that's why we collect so many items because we're happy to partner with everyone. We just launched cookware, right? Like it doesn't matter. While some of our competitors, basically pretty much all of them, have a specific interest in the stream because they make money out of processing it. While we are completely debundled for it, we're not bundled with it. And therefore we are a much cleaner proposition for councils and a much more flexible solution that could work with everyone. Great to know. A couple of really quick ones here, just about like timing. So the investment offer, the plan is to launch it on the 27th of June, which is a Tuesday. So you can put that in your in your diary in terms of um, making the investment, Simone. Um, cool. We'll just get through probably three more questions really quickly. Um, one question here from Ben, which I think is a really good one, which I wanted to get to is um, with B2B expansion, are you considering moving to large scale ventures such as stadiums? Um, and then Katrina also wanted to jump in there with a comment saying, in relation to this, I'm curious, do you have a target split between B2G, B2B, um, direct to consumer, et cetera? Can we hand that one over to you, Georgia? Not your mute. Sorry. First of all, launching in B2B in large with large clients, yes, we are already testing it. Uh, there is actually a, um, 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 a large organization um, that works in the media industry um, that is using our services. And it is like, I think they have 700 people working in the facility. So we can definitely work with large organization. Uh, we are testing as well B2B with uh, one of the biggest players in the uh, hospitality space. Uh, and two, target of B2G, B2C, B2, whatever it is. Mark, that's yours. Thanks, Giorgio. Um, so uh, we've only just started rolling out um, the B2C, the direct-to-consumer and the B2B uh, element, and we're already at, uh, it's taking up about 20% of our revenue currently. So we've, we've seen a huge growth in that part of the business. Um, in terms of what the target is, um, I mean, specific numbers will be in the offer document, um, but we anticipate that uh, that will it will get well beyond half of the the uh, the total revenue coming in will be from B two B and uh, direct to consumer, um, and that that part of the business is uh, we just see that accelerating. Cool, um, cool. We'll get through a few more. Um, thanks so much for all the questions. Can't cut it off because there's some still really some good questions we want to get to here. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up pretty soon. But thanks everyone for sticking around um, and for all the questions. We had more than 70 questions asked tonight. So very engaged audience, which is fantastic to see. There is one I would love to address because I think it, it would explain a point if you allow me, Martin, super quickly. Go for it. We don't need to make money out of... So I think Alison is asking, 
concerning about value of the items we collect versus the cost of collection. Well, unfortunately, that's completely, fortunately, it's completely disconnected. We do not need to make money out of the items we collect because we are charging you or the council for the collection. The value is a rebate that we might get, but it, we're not linked to it. So the model is not a risk if the value of the answer we collect goes up and down. We're not linked to the commodity market at all. Yeah, thanks. Cool, and that was the answer to the question saying, um, you say councils make money by using recycle smart. Is this because you're undercutting other waste management businesses such as clean way? So there you go, that's the answer there. Uh, yeah, and on top of it, we save money to customers because the risk of a fire in a plant is much le uh, is less, right? So any percentage point of the risk going down is millions of dollars for a council. Two is actually even clean away in Veolia, which we have conversation already just to updating each other, benefit from our service because the yellow bin is cleaner and therefore they have much less problems downstream uh, once they collect these recyclable bins into their own transfer stations and they find only the right stuff. So it's actually a win-win for the calcium, for the waste collection companies and for us. Yeah, cool. All right, two more questions. One from Patty, one from Michael, then we're wrapping it up. Um, Patty here is asking, what is the key driver for profitability? Is it on selling items to councils uh, or council fees or can you make the business profitable without signing up councils? Mark. <clears throat> Um, so we can make the business without signing up councils. Um, the, uh, the, there is a margin on every bag picked up, um, but as the as the business grows, then that margin we see increasing. Um, uh, Marco talked about clustering pickups. Uh, you know, as that density increases, the cost of the pickups will decrease for the business. Um, so we are not uh, dependent on councils in order to uh, become profitable. Uh, so that's that's not a, a, a massive uh, part of the uh, roadmap, uh, the reliance on, on councils. Good to know. Um, listen, I think we've actually answered your question, Michael, about soft plastics in a bit of detail. So I won't go into, into that one in too much detail. Um, here we go. One more question here from Stephanie. Uh, being in Perth, how can you leverage the price of transportation as there are no facilities here in WA? I'm not too sure what facilities you're <laughs> referring to there. Um, but yeah, I'm not too sure if there's much detail you can provide to that. Have you thought much about Perth or, or not yet? Uh, I, I can say well, one for you for to jump in. Uh, we've not put a lot of thought in Perth yet, um, but our business model like would allow us to find potential recyclers there if they are. Um, sometimes we believe they're not, but there are a few. Um, so we'll have to do that research piece first. And then if um, it happens that we have to transport um, the valuable resources back to another state, then we'll have to see, uh, first of all, if it makes sense uh, from a footprint perspective, both like economic and um, ecological, um, and then how we will price that accordingly, I would say. Cool. Cool. I might leave it there. We've got through 28 questions, lots of content. Um, and thanks everyone for sticking around. Still have lots of people on the call. In terms of wrapping up, just a couple of things from me. So like I said, 27th of June is when this investment offer goes live. Um, pencil that one in your calendars if you haven't done so already. Um, in terms of more opportunities to engage, if you had a question that wasn't answered, obviously you can reach out to the Recycle Smart team directly. There'll be some um, details in the, uh, the the email you received from Zoom in terms of this webinar for that, as well as a recording. Um, in terms of wrapping up, I just wanted to throw to the Recycle Smart team for one last pitch to investors that are still on the call as to why they should get involved in this investment offer. Um, when it goes live on Tuesday the 27th. Um, yeah, just a short elevator pitch maybe, that 30 seconds, uh, why should they invest? Oh, it's a point, right? And the point is help us scaling this through Australia. Help us making sure that everyone in Australia has access to an easy to use, simple way to recycle all the 40% of the bin and making sure it doesn't end up in landfill. Help us basically doing the right thing with the stuff we have at home. But yeah. guys, jump in if mine is too short. It's good. I think that's perfect. Sure and sweet. Sure and sweet. Um, that reminds me, it's been night for me tonight. So thanks for reminding me about that. Um, but thank you so much to the Recycle Smart team and for everyone who's uh, given us a big portion of their evening tonight to stick around and ask questions. It goes to show there's a lot of uh, interest in this topic, a lot of interest in the work that you guys are doing, the great work you've done so far. 
Um, we're really proud of Bertrand to be able to host you as an investment opportunity. Like I said, 27th of June, put that date in the calendar. There'll be another investor Q&A session next Thursday, same time. Look out for that one. Um, but thanks again, everyone. Thanks again to the Recycle Smart team. We'll leave it there and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks to you, you too, everyone. Thank you so Cheers. much. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye-bye.